Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? Well, we have another day, and we have another psalm. We are still in the sevens. Today is Psalm 78, God's Kindness to Rebellious Israel. And one of the interesting things about Bible study is you see in the Old Testament, you, you learn when you first get started and, and study the Bible, is you learn a, a very important detail of what um, the Bible does in that the Old Testament has examples of and of much of the Old Testament explains to us the New, the New Testament. It's like the Old Testament, you know, told us everything, and the New Testament um, uh, confirms it. And you you find passages in the New Testament that say the Old Testament was for an example to us. Or all the things that happened were for an example to us, to show us what the people did, uh, how everybody around them did things, what God did, and it shows. It helps to give you a more well-rounded understanding about how these things work, like salvation, God's love, stuff like that. And as you start to, when that mindset, when you start to go through the Bible and read it, you start to see all these amazing examples of just how deep God's love goes in that a people he chooses goes so far against him to the point of being called the chosen people of God, yet they were doing human sacrifice. And he still loved them. He still cared for them because he chose them. The same thing applies to us too. He chose us. We know by the scriptures that we were chosen from the very beginning. And that if he chose us, he was going to make every effort to save us despite ourselves, no matter how bad we are, no matter how what problems we come up to, you know, we, he's going to be there because he's the one maintaining our salvation, not us. And that's a, a misconception that a lot of Christians have is that we have to maintain our salvation. No. How do we maintain something we didn't get, earn, build, make, establish? God and Jesus did all that. All we were merely doing is receiving that free gift. That's it. So if it was completely designed and built and brought together by someone else, we're just receiving it. It's also maintained by that person. So it has nothing to do with what we do. Now, there's a lot of ramifications behind saying that because a lot of people say, oh, okay, well, I don't have to worry about anything. My salvation is secure. I can go live however I want. Okay. Go ahead. I'm not going to stop you. But you need to understand the warnings that go along with that kind of ideal. True, you can go live however you want. But are you willing to suffer the consequences for those decisions and actions? See, another thing you learn when you go into the Bible is that even though God loved his chosen people so much that he never walked away from them, he also brought a lot of punishment down on them too for them turning their back on him. A lot. And you go through the Old Testament, you see everything that's been done. It's bad. I mean, this last go around, uh, after 70 AD, he held them in stasis for uh, 1,900 years. Not being able to come back to their land or, or to be a people. And it was just, just in recent times that he came back. And people were allowed to come back. So basically, he pushed them out. Until the time came whenever it was time for the end to come. He brought them all back in there. Because everybody has to be in this, this one location uh, to, to do this final work. He still loves them, but he chastens them. Boy, he, he loves you dearly. And just like a father does to a son or a daughter, he chastens you dearly. Because he doesn't want you to go that route. He doesn't want you to be that way. He doesn't want you to suffer the consequences of those decisions. He wants you to make good decisions. Do you, and I know a lot of people talk about this, do you allow your child, your baby, to put a penny in the light socket? Or a paper clip or something like that? Do you allow them to learn the hard way knowing how much it could hurt them? That kind of shock can stop a baby's heart. No. You smack their hand. 
Then you remove them from the situation. And you smack their hand again. You teach them that that is not a toy not to be played with. You chastise them because you don't want to see them go through that suffering. And we do that with all our kids. We do it about drugs. We do it about anything that we know is going to be harmful for them. We arm them with as much understanding as we can until they become an adult. Now, the choices they make afterwards are on them. But we do what we can to try to help them not suffer the consequences of those things. And that's something that I always try to talk to my kids. And I would tell them, we don't tell you these things that we tell you or, or keep you from doing these things that we keep you from because we don't love you. We do it because we've already been through it. We've already seen the damage it causes and, and the problems it causes. And we don't want you to have to endure that. Now, does that mean that's going to make a difference and help them? No, not necessarily. Um, some parents don't teach any much of anything. But even armed with all that understanding, you're still going to make mistakes. It's going to happen. Can't help it. But you never stop loving them when they do make a mistake. So we have that issue going on uh, today in... No matter what, when we study, God always loves his people and takes care of his people. And the greatest example we see of that is between God and Israel. Israel was his chosen special people. His, his inheritance, just for him. And as you read through those stories and you look at it from through that lens, you start to see just how much he really does care. Just how much he, it, you know, the, his people really mattered to him. And the same thing applies to us in this time. So this morning we're going to pray Psalm 78. And I think our understanding verse is out of Second Peter. So let's get into some prayer. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. To lift you up, to be a blessing to you, and to bless you, and to thank you. I thank you for this day, for us to come together in prayer to glorify you as our God in heaven. I give thanks for the skills you've sh shown me throughout my life. Because yes, you know, I don't get to use them as much as I'd like to, but yesterday I got to use those mechanic skills that you get, you've given me. If I hadn't have been there, Lord, it would have been in probably another hour or two of working on that project. It's not because I'm better than anyone else. It's just that I know how to work on those cars and it was faster. I already knew what to do and get in there and get it done. And I had to keep people motivated <laughs> to stay on the project. But I thank you for those skills and the things that you've shown me along the way in life. Because it saves people money. It saves people time. It saves people headaches. And it has been invaluable to people. Now, not everybody values that kind of knowledge and understanding, but I do. And I thank you for that. And there are many of us who have unique skill sets that are a blessing to others, that put us in a very specific place to be a blessing to others. And you do that on purpose. I know, I know already. Because that gives an opportunity to preach the gospel. It gives an opportunity to share, to show the kindness of God's people. The one problem I've run into is when I do stuff like that, people insist on wanting to pay me. And I used to push back, but it got to the point where they would get offended. So I took it and I would go find somebody to give it to. And that's the mindset now. People don't do anything for each other anymore. There's not a, a you know, a hand-to-hand -hand help. And then later it comes around, there's, I have to pay you for this. And people can't accept help anymore. And that's our society has taught people that. And they don't understand when you do that to them and say, oh, I don't need anything. I'm, I'm glad to come help. They don't understand it. It doesn't compute with them because that's not how they were taught in the world. And what's surprising is I find people that are older than me that are like this. I was always taught you help where you can. And the person you help will help you back. And that's how you repay each other. Something comes up and you need help. Boom, they're there. And it's just a swap out. No money needs to change hands. But I see now the way the world is. People don't understand that anymore. They don't have that concept in their in mind anymore. So it's kind of disheartening and discouraging sometimes to be a part of that. But there are ways around it. And you make ways around it. And I am still glad that I have the ability to do that for people. It's, it's pretty awesome. 
it's amazing to be able to help someone who, especially someone who goes and has a bunch of stuff done on their vehicle or their trailer, still doesn't work. And I go out there and I'm able to fix it in a few minutes. The, the, the tractor. You help me with that tractor. Three people, three years. Nobody was able to get this thing going. I got it going in three days. And finished it in about another week or two. And had it running, ready to go. That's all skills you gave me. That's all understanding that you gave me. And it has made my life very easy because I already know what to do on certain things. I know what to watch for. And that's all skills you gave me. What I want everyone else to understand is that you gave them skills too. Very unique skills that make them usable to you. And you put them in areas to make them usable to you. And it's for your glory and to further the gospel. So we all have our part to play. And you direct each one of us. And even, like I said in the beginning, you chastise us to put us in the place you need us to be effective witnesses for you. I'm glad for that. And I'm thankful for that. And it is it, it hurts sometimes. It's painful. It's you know discouraging. It's depressing. But... If we put our head down and weather through it and get to the other side, we're always better for that chastisement, for your training. If we just be quiet and go on through it. And you don't do it because you hate us. You do it because you love us. Your word very clearly says that. And we should rejoice that we have that in our lives. We just talked about this recently. Because if we don't, the scripture says we are disavowed. We don't belong in the family. But if we have that, that shows we are. So I'm very glad that I have that because that shows that I am in the family. I am happy to get my bottom spanked or my hand spanked when I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> this morning, Father, we have Psalm 78. God's kindness to rebellious Israel. And like I talked about in the beginning before we started praying, it, that the Bible is full of examples of how you... That's a really good video that just popped up there. How you... Um, no matter what your people do, still love them and care for them and protect them. And we can look in world history and see it. I mean, after 1900 years, you brought them all back. Not, not every one of them, but you brought them back to Israel and reestablished Israel. Israel is one of the top countries in the world. Was it fourth on the stock exchange? Eighth most powerful nation in the world? And at their widest point, they're only 70 miles across. That's amazing. And that's all your work. No, even though they're rebellious, even though they turn away, even though they go to really, really bad places, you still take care of them. You're still kind to them. You still bless them. And you do that to all of us. You stand ready to receive any one of us who turns back from the wilderness. Parable of the prodigal son all, every day. And that shows the depth of your love. That shows the, the, the level, the, the intensity of your love for your creation. So I'd like to pray Psalm 78 this morning. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children. That the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright, and whose spirit was not faithful to God. The children of Ephraim, being armed with and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law, and forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. Marvelous things he did in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through, and he made the water stand up like a heap. 
In the daytime also he led them with the cloud, and all the night with a light of fire. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink in abundance like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. But they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. And they tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was furious. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel, because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. Yet he had commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down manna on them to eat and gave them of the bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food. He set them food sent them food to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he brought in the south wind. He also rained meat on them like the dust, feathered fowl like the sand of the sea. Fun fact I'd like to share on verse 27, those doves still every year go to that exact same place, every single year at the same time, which is the time they were there. 3,000 years <laughs> or more, those doves are still flying there. And he let them fall in the midst of their camp all around their dwellings. So they ate and were filled, for he gave them their own desire. They were not deprived of their craving, but while their food was still in their mouths, the wrath of God came against them and slew the stoutest of them and struck down the choice men of Israel. In spite of this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wondrous works. Therefore, their days he consumed in futility and their years in fear. When he slew them, then he sought them, and they returned and sought earnestly for God. Then they remembered that God was their rock, and the Most High God their Redeemer. Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth, and they lied to him with their tongue, for their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yes, again and again they tempted God and, lim and limited the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power, the day when he redeemed them from the enemy, when he worked his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan, turned their rivers into blood and their streams that they could not drink. He sent swarms of flies among them which devoured them, and frogs which destroyed them. He also gave their crops to the caterpillar and their labor to the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore trees with frost. He also gave up their cattle to the hail and their flocks to the fiery lightning. He cast on them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, indignation, and trouble by sending angels of destruction among them. He made a path for his anger. He did not spare their soul from death, but gave their life over to the plague and destroyed all the firstborn in Egypt, the first of their strength in the tents of Ham. But he made his own people go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. And he led them on safely so that they did not fear, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. And he brought them to his holy border this mountain which his right hand had acquired. He also drove out the nations before them, allotted them an inheritance by survey, and made the tribes of Israel dwell in their tents. Yet they tested and provoked the Most High God, and did not keep his testimonies, but turned back and acted unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. For they provoked him to anger in their high places, and moved him to jealousy with their carved images. When God heard this, he was furious and greatly abhorred Israel, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent he had placed among men, and delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hands. He also gave his people over to the sword and was furious with his inheritance. The fire consumed their young men and their maidens were not given in marriage. Their priests fell by the sword and their widows made no lamentation. Then the Lord awoke from as from sleep, like a mighty man who shouts because of wine, and he beat back his enemies. He put them to perpetual reproach. Moreover, he rejected the tent of Joseph and did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. 
but chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. And he built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth, which he had established forever. He also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes that had young, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. Father, that and this isn't even all that you've done. There's so much more. We have periods of, of quiet that fall in, but you've done so much more besides this. You've done so many other things that aren't even listed here. This was just to his time frame. And it shows your love and your desire for your people, your chosen people. And we see that evident in our lives. We see that evident in, in every walk that we have and we partake in. And it never ceases to amaze me personally when I see just how much time you take with your people and the patience that you have with all of us. And it's, and I'm so thankful for that patience. It gives me time to see the light and to change and to change my direction and make it more towards you and to learn to step back and take my hands away from the situation and allow you to handle it and deal with it. And in one of these verses up here, it talks about that, that they limited you. And we do the same thing. And we do the video talking about these songs. We'll dig into that more. But we do the same thing in our everyday lives now. We think we've got it under control. We run in and we try to fix it when we know we can't. And that, you step back and take your hands off. Okay, I'm not going to force this on you. Until we learn to be quiet, trust in you and step back and let you work. And when we do, we see you work and do an amazing work in that situation and in every situation. I can't think of a life now without having you in it and without you running it. I still do things that um, I, I'm trying to do with my ideas, but more and more every day. I learned to let go and let you deal with all of it. Because when I let go and let you deal with all of it, it goes perfectly every single time. It's, it's, a, it's no small thing to be called by you to be a part of the body of Christ. It's no, no simple matter to be saved. It's the most incredible thing. It's the most important thing. It's the, the biggest issue. And so many people make light of salvation, and I, I, they can't, they shouldn't do that. I don't see how they can, because that's the most important thing. But again, it's the world that's teaching these things. We have been taught this for so long, to ignore the most important things, and to be focused on the least important things. So many people place so much emphasis on spiritual gifts, when they should be placing the emphasis on the God that gave them. But today, that's not the case. Today, it's all about us. It's all about me. Me, me, me. It's all about what I can do. It's all about my truth. Lord, I, you gave me tons of skills and taught me how to do things. I have a lifetime of memories that two men can hold on to. But it has nothing to do with me. It, I give you all the credit because you led me through that life. And I don't regret a single minute of it. And I'm glad that I went through what I went through. And I'm glad I, su I su survived what I've survived. You've taught me so many things. And it had nothing to do with me. It was all you. Because everything that came out of it has been worked to my betterment and to my good. And it's great. I can't complain. When I look for things to complain for, I can't complain. Father, you are to be glorified. You are to be praised because of the work you do and that you open our eyes to see it. You don't hide it from us. You open our eyes to be witness to these things and to know these things. And that way, we're not taken off guard. That way, we're not surprised. 
That way we see you working and know what's going on and can get out of the way of it. That way we can recognize trouble and deception when it comes and avoid it. That way we can see what's happening and follow along that path that you, of where you're going. Taking us to those divine appointments, taking us out of danger, taking us to those things that you have prepared for us for our betterment. And it's awesome. It's so awesome. I can go on and on about the things that you've done. On and on. And it never, it never ceases to impress me. And when I am able to share these testimonies with other people, they're shocked and surprised. Sadly, today, most of us don't sit down and think about the things that you've done for us. And we really should. We should count our blessings. We should contemplate your work in our lives. And I pray that all the brethren do that. Because it is a, such a good thing. And now we have our understanding verse, Father, and it's 2 Peter 3, 18. And it's a perfect understanding verse for this. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And we should be growing in that grace and knowledge. As our life progresses, and as we study, and as we learn more about ourselves and about you, we should be growing. But a lot of Christians are stuck in the same place. I hope that they, they see the light and change and grow past where they're at. Many of them have gotten to a place where they're very comfortable. And we were never called to be comfortable here. We have, we'll have a good life, or a better life. But just like the scriptures say, there's going to be turmoil and trouble in the lives of Christians. It's just the way things are. But you never leave us nor forsake us. You never abandon us. You never leave us in the dark without help and without light. And we understand that it changes how we view the problems in our lives. It changes how we view the things that we do. It's a glorious thing to have a God like you, the only God on our side, or better yet, we're on your side. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your attention, for your blessings, for the works that you do in each and every one of our lives and what you've been doing from the very beginning of all things to now, and even the things you were doing before the beginning. This is another thing people don't contemplate. What were you doing before all this? I give thanks for that. Because that was the lead up to this. And I, I can't even begin to grasp anything that happened before creation. And I also give thanks for what's coming. Because I know what's coming is going to be even better. Thank you, Father. We love you and we bless you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you guys for joining me for morning prayer. Don't take this stuff for granted. Don't take it lightly. This is everything. What God is doing in our lives, what our Father in heaven is specifically doing for each one of us is grand and it's specific and it's to be recognized and, and responded to. Our salvation is not a small thing. The lives that we're living by his control and him, him leading us is no small thing. Our chastisement is no small thing. What we're suffering through and seeing right now in the world is no small thing. Give thanks this day to our Father in heaven for those things, for all those things. Because it's those things that make you who you are right now. I love you guys. I bless you all in Jesus' name. I had planned on doing uh, another video from Isaiah and another parable. But I'm pretty sore. I don't know if I'm going to be able to. Um, I'm going to try to sit up for a little bit and see what happens. But I may end up laying back down. <laughs> but if I can, I'll do them and I'll post them. But if I can't, then I'll do them tomorrow. Love you guys. Bless you all in Jesus' name, and I will see you guys in the next video.